Thank you for everybody for coming out tonight. This is this is wonderful, wonderful um, turnout. One thing before we get started with this that came in from the dark. I just had to show this because I think it's pretty cool. They came in from the that they found at the Dartford Historical Society in their archives, and it's a set of architectural plans by um, architect named Marcus Radway. Any of you familiar with him? And all it said on there, it didn't have an, usually when they do architectural plans, it'll have a name of who it was for. And I didn't see anything there, but it did say, something's a little blurred out, and it said Ripton, Wisconsin. So looking him up, um, he was here in the 1870s for about 40 years. He died in 1917. Um, architect in Ripon. Um, and it turns out that he lived in the house right here on um, Thorne and Watson, the southeast corner, 503. Watson was his house, and I don't know, I haven't <coughs> had a chance to research enough to find out if that was actually, if he designed and built it, or just how that all worked. But in um, September, we're going to be do, having a presentation on, you know, researching your house, so um, if any of you have, happen to have any yep. house plans, abstract, anything, that uh, that name turns up, we'd love to hear about it because that um, in our files we have some photographs of him. We have one little photograph of the house, but nothing about his work, like right staring me in the face or anything. So that would be really nice to have as a collection of what did he build. Um, I looked up Pedrick, it said he had, had built several buildings, but he didn't say what they were. We have no list of what they were. Um, so that's what I love about this place, what I love about this city, is these things just keep popping up. It's wonderful. Um, tonight's presentation all came about. I have to thank Pat Ron because she was driving between Ripon and, and uh, Oshkosh last summer. It's like, what's going on over there? <laughs> that's how this all started, and with asking questions and turning over to the paper and getting involved. That is how we found out that this was going on. So. Uh, I hope you enjoy this presentation tonight. Uh, Paul Reckner, um, I'll read his bio. That's what he said. <laughs> uh, Paul Reckner all true. grew up in southeastern Pennsylvania where he got involved in his first historical archaeology project. Since then, he has also worked in Colorado, New York, New Jersey, Virginia, and most recently Wisconsin. In 2009, he completed his PhD in anthropology at the State University of New York at Binghamton. And his dissertation focused on ethnic and racial diversity in early 20th century coal towns of south, southern Colorado. He's also published several articles and essays on the archaeology of 19th century New York City. Paul relocated to Wisconsin in 2001 and has worked with the Wisconsin Historical Society's Museum Archaeology Program <laughs> um, that's mm -hmm. for the past 10 years. He is also co-director of the Fort Atkinson Archaeology Project currently lives in Madison with his spouse and their two Australian cattle dogs. And we are just, we are thrilled he volunteered to come and uh, and speak with us about his his work on Highway 44. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. thank you, thank you. Thanks, Carol. And, and thank you all for coming on such a beautiful <laughs> Thursday evening. It, there was a great, there were so many ways you could have started the weekend early, but I'm so glad you're here. Um, so as, as Carol said, my name's Paul. I work for the Wisconsin Historical Society Museum Archaeology Program. We just call it MAP. Um, I'm a field archaeologist. Uh, I'll kind of get into a little bit more about what that entails uh, as part of our talk. But um, I know uh, Carol was telling me that, that the paper ran uh, of an ad for the talk and said this was going to be about the Underground Railroad. And so it will be about the Underground Railroad, but it's about some other things too. Uh, so we're going to cover a, a pretty wide range of stuff, but I just wanted to say, you know, thanks to the, the Ripon Historical Society for, for giving me this opportunity. Um, as I said, I'll talk a little bit more about what we do and how we do it uh, at the beginning of the talk, but I just wanted to say, you know, typically we do a lot of what's called rescue archaeology in, in some areas. So um, a lot of times we're working under very tight budgets and deadlines and we kind of come into a, a place and there's a site and it needs to be excavated and we dig it up and we run away with all the stuff and nobody ever hears from us ever again. Um, and 
that, that's what I don't want to happen. Uh, so that's why you know, I, I feel like it's really incumbent on us to make the effort to come back and you know, talk to you all, you know, share with you all who probably care more about you know, the history of this area than anyone else, you know, what we found and what we, what we were doing, what we discovered. So, so that's why I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. And I'm really glad that, that you all were willing to join me here. Um, I'll say, uh, so one other thing. So, so uh, we're working on a project in Southern Dane County right now. So I was in the field this, this well, all day. Um, <laughs> at one point I was working on my talk under a shade tree in the middle of a meadow. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think I got all the ticks off of me. But I just want to say, you know, if, if I suddenly lose my train of thought and I, I curse and grab some part of my anatomy, it's, it's not Tourette's, it's just, it's just a tick, probably. So, so with all that aside, um, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. This is digging up stories of, new stories of early Rosendale. Um, I like to kind of start with, with this cartoon because I think it's great. It kind of captures everything that we all think about archaeology in one, in one great little package. You know, typically, right, you think archaeology, you think Indiana Jones and temples and, you know, golden statuettes and things like that. Um, so why do archaeology in Rosendale, right? But what, what, part of what I want to talk about today is the, the kind of archaeology I do is called, typically it's called historical archaeology. And it, it focuses on the recent past, kind of instead of, you know, these, these exotic places and these long lost societies and civilizations. Um, and the, the advantage of what we do is, because we're working on more recent eras, we have the written record. So we're able to combine the, the written documents with our archaeological data. And you know, typically what you'll, you'll see as we go through the talk, we use a lot of the same sources that if you all who are probably doing genealogy, is, is anybody working on genealogy projects right now or, or old house research projects? You'll see we use a lot of the same sources that you all are familiar with, but we use them in slightly different ways. And that's kind of one of the things I want to highlight tonight is, is how, how we can kind of deploy that same information uh, to some, some, different, some different ends. But they get us to some really interesting places. Um, so I know I'm kind of teach, preaching to the choir here, but you know, what we find in historical archaeology is a lot of the really interesting things that happened in the past just never got written down. You know, nobody had time. They didn't think it was interesting back then. Uh, they didn't want anyone to know, <laughs> you know, 100 years from now what happened. Um, but, you know, these things that we would really like to know, not in the written record. And that is kind of the beauty of historical archaeology is we have this additional set of data. We have all this material, these, uh, these objects, these uh, pieces of architecture that we can excavate from the ground and kind of compare with the written record and fill in, you know, some of those gaps. So that's, that's kind of the real strength and, and kind of that's my, my pitch for why it still makes sense to do archaeology you know, in Rosendale Township in the mid-19th century. Um, so we'll see, see what you think <laughs> as we go forward. Um, but this is, this is the, the big picture. This is kind of what I want to do tonight. So we're going to talk a little bit first about, you know, why, why did we decide to dig on State Highway 44 anyway? Um, and then talk specifically about the archaeology and the history of the Sanders Blacksmith Shop site. I want to walk you guys through the sort of process of discovery and investigation that we go through. Um, I, I think it kind of makes for a nice narrative, but it also gives you guys a sense of sort of, again, specifically how we do what we do, because it's not, it's not the kind of archaeology you're necessarily thinking of. Um, as a result, we're going to talk a little about beer and, of course, blacksmithing uh, and some ongoing research. Uh, sadly, and, and yet beautifully, spring came awfully early this year, so we were not able to finish our research over the winter. Uh, we were out in the field, I was telling Carol, we were out in the field, oh, April 14th or something like that in the snow. Um, and we've been out there ever since, and it just hasn't stopped. So, so there are some points at the, in the talk where I'm going to have to say, stay tuned, because we're going to have some interesting stuff evolving that, that we just haven't gotten to yet um, in terms of the archaeological research. Um, but, um, but we do have some pretty good stuff, and we're going to take a look at who James Sanders was. It turns out, not only blacksmith, farmer, but also a bit of a radical activist. And this creates a really interesting story, and we're going to look at through kind of genealogical and local, political, historical sources. So that's, that's our big picture. That's kind of where, where I want to end up. And I, you know, I think, as with you know, any good history, any good archaeology really ends up being about people. right? So uh, I'm going to try to bring this back to the Sanders family as much as I can. Um, you know, we found some neat artifacts, and there's some neat sources. But, but at the end, this is really you know, about a family and a, and a particular individual and a particular historical period that I think is what makes this really kind of a compelling story. 
but so, uh, so why were we digging on Highway 44? Um, this is the area, of course, we were working in. It's, it's basically this stretch of 44 between kind of the northeast side of Ripon and the, the Fond du Lac Winnebago County line. Um, so a very particular stretch of road, right? And that wasn't entirely accidental because as probably most of you know, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation is planning to reconstruct, you know, God help us all, right? The, that stretch of highway in the next few years. So the archeology span that we're doing is part of the whole sort of planning and construction process. Um, the, the idea is essentially what it's called is cultural resource management or sometimes section 106 archeology. span but, but essentially this is a, a, a mandate whenever uh, construction is proposed and it involves federal funds or permits, uh, the construction manager is required to do archaeology along with history and you know, lots of other things. But, but basically the spirit of the legislation as I like to kind of compartmentalize it is, nutshell it, if you will, is whenever a construction uh, is intended to go forward using federal taxpayer dollars, the result should not, it should not end in important local historical landmarks being destroyed. And so that's what we're kind of out there doing, is trying to protect, to identify and protect these local historical sites, be they archeological or architectural, um, and sort of ideally help the highway planners work around them if at all possible. And if not, then you know, recover what information we can before the bulldozers erase that stuff forever. So that, that's, that's why I kind of, I refer to sometimes what we do as rescue archeology. span and why sometimes it seems like we sweep in out of the night, you know, take your stuff and leave. Because um, sometimes it is, it is an awful, awful schedule that we keep. But, but so this is, this is how things started. Um, back in 2006, when the, the highway construction planning process was in early stages, we did what's called a phase one survey. And that's basically where we start. And we, we look along the entire corridor where the project engineers indicate that they might have to do construction that might disturb the ground service. And one of my colleagues, uh, who I actually was only involved at the very end of this, uh, was working with his crew. And you can see we're, we're about six miles northeast of Ripon here um, on 44. That's Springbrook Road is intersecting with 44 just, uh, just off the aerial here that I have. Um, and uh, look at this field here just on the northwest side. There's a, a little farm, farm complex on the southeast side there. So, so they came upon this field. And it looked a lot like this when they found it as well. The only weird part was it was covered in slag. And uh, by slag, I mean this stuff here, this stuff that looks like little meteorites. You know, it's hard, shiny, glassy nodules. Um, typically, these are the byproduct of metalworking. And I thought, well, what's it doing here in the middle of this field? Uh, and there was quite a lot of it. So that's what sort of got the ball rolling here. And that's kind of how we, how we operate. So, my colleagues did a, a quick walkover of the plowed field, collected all the slag, and along with it, they also found you know, quite a few bits and pieces of crockery, glassware, you know, domestic household objects, um, small fragments you know, that had been broken up by the plow over the years, scattered all across this field, kind of in that highlighted area. And you know, again, you can kind of see right, right across from the, this existing farmhouse there, uh, they did some subsurface testing and they found this kind of big disturbed area. We thought, hmm, well, that looks a lot like what a, an old root cellar looks like when it gets filled in over the years. Uh, and that's pretty cool because that usually means that's an early occupation site, uh, just an old earthen cellar. So, so this, was, this was good. These were all good signs. So typically what we do when we get signs in the field is we can go back to the archives. So this was our kind of first run at the research. Um, just an initial kind of what, are, what might we be looking at here. So this is 1874 Platte, Fond du Lac County, right? And you can see right here, it's labeled B's shop, which is a typical kind of 19th century map maker short, shorthand for a blacksmith shop. So, okay, so our slag starts to make a little more sense. And you can kind of see around it, there, this map is just full of all kinds of interesting details. You know, there's, let me see if I can get this to work here. Do I have to push a button, Carol, on this, or does it just yeah. figure out if I'm pointing? Yes. Yeah, there we go, yeah. So you can see there's a, another dwelling marked here on the map. These really regular areas of trees are typically orchards, you know, and then a woodlot back here. So all kinds of interesting, you know, landscape details. And a name, most interestingly, this name here, J.W. Sanders. We had no idea who J.W. Sanders was, but we were gonna find out. Um, as we started to poke around, we found 
miraculously, this doesn't happen often, a lithograph uh, published in 1874 of the James W. Sanders farm. Um, if, if you're familiar with the property in the area where I'm looking, if you can kind of project that, those buildings onto this, this lithograph, it hasn't changed a whole lot. There are a few little details are different, but, but this is basically the, the, the architecture that's still standing there. What was a little, so that was really exciting. You know, that was kind of cool that we don't usually get to see a site. The only problem is our site is actually kind of down over here. We're on the other side of the road. Um, and that, that turns out to be really interesting. But from there, we did a little bit of deed research. So this is kind of, you know, really common if you're doing uh, architectural history or, or genealogical work sometimes. But here we found our guy again, James Sanders, picking up a, a state of Wisconsin and a U.S. Um, bull. What am I, why can't I think of the word, right? It's the, the, the deed, right? The, um, the, no, no, it's the, the one that comes from the federal government, right? Is a, uh, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. So in the, in the late 1840s, settling in section six, uh, and he's got you know, quite a spread of land. So, but then we can see right away, um, he hangs on to it for decades. In 1883, he sells the whole thing. So, a nice period of occupation that we're looking at. And then, you know, we kind of hit some more gold. In the 1880 history of Fond du Lac County, James Sanders was apparently a prominent enough individual that he got a, a write-up, a little biographical sketch in the history of Fond du Lac County. And this tells us all kinds of great stuff about how he was born in upstate New York and apprenticed as a blacksmith and then uh, migrated out west through Ohio and then to, um, to Wisconsin. You know, talks about his family and how he originally, uh, what they call preempted, basically he squatted on some unoccupied government land and then acquired legal title to it shortly thereafter as he improved it. Uh, in 1846, so even a little earlier than, than of course, the official deeds show. Um, and he built a small cabin. So that's interesting because the lithograph from 1874, that's not a small cabin. Um, but what we found across the road, that's kind of the root cellar that you might put under a small cabin. So we were, you know, we were looking at something kind of, you know, foundational, kind of, kind of early on. So with all that done uh, and looking very promising as the, the whole planning process moved forward. Two years later, um, my colleagues came out again who did what we call phase two. Uh, and this is a more intensive look. And our goal really here is to try to establish whether or not an archaeological site has the kind of research potential or historical significance to, uh, to make it eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, that's just kind of a threshold. Uh, doesn't, doesn't mean a whole lot otherwise, but if we find that a site does have a lot of significance and would be eligible, then that gives us some, some room to move in the future. And that was, so that was our goal here. So more digging, more archival research. And sure enough, um, I, I should step back real quick here. I should explain. So typically when we're working in agricultural fields, you know, basically after hundreds of years of plowing, that first foot, foot and a half of soil has been completely churned up by, by plowing. Um, it still has stuff in it, but in terms of finding any uh, intact evidence of structures, former houses, you know, barn foundations, what have you, root cellars, it's just not going to be there in that upper soil zone. So what we do is have heavy equipment come in, we strip off just that, that upper plow zone, that topsoil, and then we expose the intact surface of what we call the subsoil below it. And what we look for are these telltale dark stains that have funny shapes that shouldn't just be there. And sure enough, so uh, in the area where my colleagues had done some initial testing and they thought they found some disturbance, we find a funny looking shape and it shouldn't be there almost right across from the standing house. As they began to sample it, sure enough, it's full of demolition debris. Uh, so this is almost certainly a cellar, an earthen cellar now. Um, to, just to, to explain a little bit, typically, when, when settlers came in, right, and they were, they were kind of living hand to mouth, you know, in those first couple of years, and you needed a roof over your head, you wanted walls between you and the outside world. So typically, the first thing that they built, if it wasn't a barn, um, you know, was, was a cabin, as, as rude as could be, whatever they could get on, get together to, to you know, provide some protection from the elements. 
Uh, and typically they would excavate an earthen cellar under the kitchen wing of the, the cabin. And that was, you know, also typically pretty, pretty raw, bare bones. You know, earthen walls, earthen floor. It was usually accessed just through a, a trap door and maybe, maybe a ladder if it was really fancy. You know, it wasn't, wasn't a full depth cellar. It would, if you're lucky, you know, you had maybe four feet. And the only purpose of these was really to store uh, perishable food over the winter, things that needed to be kept cold so as to not spoil, but couldn't freeze. So it provided just that little bit of, uh, you know, uh, cold storage, if you will, to kind of get you through the winter. Maybe you kept your seeds down here for next season. Um, so, so these can be absolute gold mines, you know, because once, once the structure is abandoned, and filled back in, you know, that it's no longer useful. The, the hole, the cellar hole is just kind of an eyesore. It becomes a great place to get rid of your crap. You know, you've got household waste. There's no, you know, there's no curbside pickup for garbage. So if you have a, a hole in the ground, it's a great place to get rid of your junk. Uh, and that's, of course, what we really want to find is what people are throwing away because that gives us a, a, great, um, a great window into what household life, what daily life was like for these people. Uh, so in addition to the cellar, we also found a number of these extremely, you know, and they really show up well in these photos, these really dark, dark stains in the soil. These are related to the blacksmith shop. You know, they were just filled with exactly what they look like, coal, charcoal, uh, cinders, slag, you know, all the things that you would expect would accumulate from a blacksmith shop operation. So this was great news too, because that means we not only had evidence of the domestic side of the Sanders story, but we also had you know, his work side, his work life preserved there. And so they found some kind of neat stuff, you know, a moderate scatter of many of the same sorts of things that they found in the initial survey. You know, some domestic ceramics on the left there, some, let me, let me just step back so you can see this one more time. Can you do it for me? There we go. Um, in the middle there, you see some uh, tobacco pipes, oops. You're just not going to show. Yeah, yeah, they want to show. Tobacco pipes and some buttons, little toys. It's a coin down there in the lower in the middle. 1849, I believe, large, large Liberty head scent. Um, and then, of course, a lot of kind of ugly chunks of rusty metal. Uh, but they're going to be important, and we'll get back to those in a bit. So again, continuing with some of the census research that, that you all would do you know, just identically. We tracked down, of course, James Sanders and his family in 1850. And see, it's, a, it's quite a small family. You know, they've only been here for four years, so not surprising. Uh, his profession is listed as blacksmith. So great. That's exactly what we would expect. Um, then we followed up, took a look at him in 1860. So 10 years later, family's, of course, grown you know, exponentially, uh, much larger household. But now his occupation is listed as farmer. So that's interesting. That kind of tells us that something happened there, that at some point, maybe he started to put less time into the blacksmithing portion of, of his operation and focus more on farming. And so that's kind of a narrative that we're going to follow through on. Also interesting, uh, since they, they recorded personal wealth, you can kind of see uh, between 1850 and 1860, his personal wealth, or his real estate, I should say, value, you know, nearly, what? I can't even remember what the term would be for 10 times. Anyway, it increased by nearly 10 times. So, you know, so this is a successful individual, successful family uh, in a lot of, you know, sort of basic financial ways. Um, so that, that, you know, starts to give us a bit more of the narrative of who these people were and what their life, lifestyle was like. Um, this will show up a little bit. I'll explain this. So we also uh, looked at property taxes for the early periods. And, and you all, if you're researching in uh, the Fond du Lac County, Ripon Township particularly area, or sorry, Rosendale Township area, you guys are really lucky because there's a fabulous set of property tax records that go, the original, the original folios that go all the way back to the 1850s, I think, does it start? When did we start here? 1850, yeah. And there are some gaps, but what's really interesting about this stuff, so this chart tracks the, the value of James Sanders' property in blue, and then the value of all of his neighbors' properties in section six in red. And then the green line is, his, is James Sanders' personal wealth. And some interesting things happen when you look here. There's two periods. Right here between 1860 and 62, you can see, uh, let's use this guy. There we go. Yeah, you see all of a sudden, you know, he's basically hanging with the, with the neighbors in terms of 
its property values, and all of a sudden there's a, a gap in the data here. But then all of a sudden right here, James' property suddenly becomes significantly more valuable even as his neighbor's properties drop, probably just due to you know, global economic fluctuations. And at that same time, James starts spending a lot of money. <laughs> his green line is going down. And so that says to us, okay, somebody's investing in their property and they're spending a lot of money to do it. So what are our guess, our best guess is that 1860 to 62 is when that you know, fancy modern farmhouse that shows up in the 1874 lithograph was built. You know, they had been occupying their cabin since 1846. It was probably getting a little rough around the edges, uh, even more rough around the edges. And they had you know, sort of stabilized their farm. You know, they, they had you know, managed their, their own sustenance and had accumulated some wealth. So they were able to you know, contemplate, okay, we're going to build a new house and it's going to you know, show to the community and our neighbors that you know, we've, we've made it, that we've been successful and that we're a stable family. So, so we think that's what happened, 1860 to 62. And for us as archeologists, you know, we kind of, we're sort of obsessed with time. And so now we have a beginning date, 1846, they come and they build their cabin. 1860, 62, they abandon their cabin, build their new house across the street, and presumably demolish or maybe salvage material from the cabin, fill in that cellar, or at least begin that process. So, so for us, that, that tells us what that time capsule that we're looking at inside that cellar covers. So that's really important for us. And then I, I just wanted to point out, there, there's a second, we don't really know what this means, but just using the tax records, there's a second um, episode where the same, the same pattern plays out. Sanders' property gets more valuable, his neighbors are really not increasing in the same way, and he's spending more money. So we think you know, this is maybe a second wave of improvements to the house, or maybe they're investing in you know, agricultural buildings, improving the, the farm structure. So, so we don't know for sure about that one, but we can be pretty sure 1860, they build their fancy new house. Then we run across this. And you know, this is kind of why I do this job. Because <laughs> you don't see this headline every day. Um, so this is our guy, this is James Sanders. Uh, his obituary published uh, in the Fond du Lac Commonwealth, 1904. And you know, how many places do you see where so, so the narrative is quite long, and they're relying on his uh, younger brother, who's uh, survived him and still lives in Milwaukee, as the source. But you can see here, he says, uh, they're describing the, the little schoolhouse meeting, March 20th, 1854, and they say, after a fruitless discussion as to an appropriate name for the club, Mr. Sanders moved that, the, that it be named the Republican Party, and this motion was adopted unanimously. Hmm, that's, you know, that's a new one on me. So that's pretty cool. Um, and it goes on and it also talks, so here's, here's where the Underground Railroad part starts to show up. It also claims that he was uh, a, one of the strongest abolitionists and that he was in fact a conductor on the Underground Railroad, which is great because as we'll talk a little bit more later, and you all probably have a good sense, it's really hard to find documented claims, uh, supportable claims to involvement in the Underground Railroad because it was secret, you know? And so, so this, these, these two factors together, along with what we're seeing in the archeology, span really indicated to us that there's some research potential here. So it really was what we call eligible for the National Register. And as a result, as the planning process for construction moved forward, we were able to say, well, if you guys need to build something in this area, we need, we need to look at this more closely. There's, there's material here that would be a loss to the community if it was destroyed. So that brings us to last summer. And we were actually able to come back, or I guess it was kind of fall by the end we got out here, but um, we were able to reopen the site and basically pick up right where we left off, uh, excavating the root cellar that our colleagues had found. And so we started digging and digging, and it turned out to be monstrous. And finally, we excavated the entire thing. Um, this is it. This is, this is basically the footprint of the original root cellar that would have stood beneath the, the kitchen wing of the cabin, of the Sanders cabin. Um, What's frustrating is a lot of times these cabins, because they were not built to last and they didn't have permanent footings of any sort. So in a plowed field, all evidence of the footprint of the original cabin is gone. You know, we have no idea how big the cabin was, how it actually sat in relation to this, this cellar, other than it was over top in some fashion. Um, but this is basically what we have. This is what is left of the Sanders cabin for us anymore. Um, so we excavated the entire thing. And we were able to recover a lot of kind of cool stuff. Um, 
And it's basically uh, continuing the theme. You, know, you see a whole series of different types of ceramics here. Uh, up top, you know, there's uh, some what we call shell edge, and then there's some hand-painted stuff in this sort of second tier there. Then some pretty fancy transfer prints, um, not, not unusual for the 1850s, 60s, 70s, but, but you know, more costly. So the, these, are, these were probably the fancy dishes. This is what they brought out you know, when guests were coming over. Then some more kind of common wares uh, in the fourth tier there, some multi-colored multi sponge decorated stuff, which is just like what it sounds. They take a sponge, dip it in pigment, sponge it on the plate, fire it. Uh, so it's very cheap, but, but colorful, you know, and often kind of used as, as utilitarian wares around the house. You know, it was sort of, I don't want to compare it directly to corning ware, but, but basically, you know, it's what you had your cereal in in the morning. And then similarly, the, the blue ceramic on the bottom there is what we call an annular ware. That was often tea wares or small bowls, and, and also um, kind of utilitarian. Uh, again, you know, very colorful, but not, not necessarily something you would bring out for guests if you could afford it. And they could. And they also, we also found quite a bit of this uh, you know, very clean, somewhat later 1870s um, white ironstone ceramic. Uh, it's hard to see in the light here. Oh, actually, could we, is there any way we could drop the, the light a little bit? The, the pattern might show up a bit better. That's, actually, can we get the stuff in the front, the lights in the front down? Those will probably help a little more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe better. But um, so these are molded with a kind of botanical naturalistic pattern. Um, you know, and this again probably would have been sort of a, a, the second generation of, uh, you know, neighbors are coming to dinner kind of dishware. So we get to, you know, we get to see, again, because we're looking at essentially their garbage, the things that broke, you know, in the household that they threw out into the empty open cabin cellar across the street pretty much what was happening in, in their household on a daily basis. You know, somebody broke the teacup and out it went. But this gives us an immediate idea of, of kind of what, where they were spending their money, what kinds of things they were purchasing, how they pre presented themselves publicly. So, you know, small things, but, but meaningful things, right? And that's kind of, kind of how we work as archaeologists. Also, lots of clay tobacco pipes. Um, these are, I don't know, for, for those of you maybe who aren't familiar with, these are just plain white ceramic pipes. Maybe you've seen pictures of you know, the, the character with the long white stemmed pipe. These are kind of the, the second generation of those. Um, probably the, the most common way that tobacco was consumed in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, very expendable, very cheap, very ten uh, strong tendency to break, which is great for us again because you know, they litter historic sites. And you know, one, so someone around, around the blacksmith shop smoked. But what's kind of more interesting is there's a lot of diversity in the designs that we're finding on these. So either somebody had pretty, uh, I don't want to say diverse tastes, or there were a lot of people coming to that spot and sitting around smoking. And this kind of conjures up some interesting images of how blacksmith shops function socially, particularly in rural communities. Um, you know, they were kind of like, they were sort of the next best thing to the bar, particularly in a dry town, right, where, where typically men could go and socialize, you know, share news, gossip, talk politics, whatever, uh, you know, while you were getting, you know, the shoe on your best horse fixed. Um, so they kind of become these, these neat social nexuses. And this kind of perhaps starts to explain how James Sanders kind of becomes, it takes on this very central role in the community that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, and some other sort of small personal items, buttons, um, that, that little gray pointy thing on the second tier there, that's actually a slate stylus that would have been used to write on a blackboard. Um, so it talks a little bit about you know, literacy. Um, it's a, a bone handle from a utensil there on the third tier. And then the thing at the bottom there, does anybody know what that is? Anybody seen one of those before? It's a comb. Yeah, it's a particular kind of comb. <laughs> It's a little, little uncomfortable for us <laughs> in this era, but it had a very specific purpose. Anybody know? It, it's, yeah, it's about bugs. It's, it's a lice comb. Um, and these are, these are neat. And so they're, they're <laughs> manufactured in very, very fine form, of course, you know, because the tines have to be very close together to do their job of combing out the critters. Um, but you know, this was a way that people managed you know, what was a, you know, just up until what? 100 years ago, 70, 70 years ago, was just a you know, pernicious problem. 
right? Um, and they're so delicate, they rarely preserve, but the conditions were sort of just right that we were able to, to recover the parts of one. It's, it can probably be reassembled once we get a little bit more time. But, but again, so you know, right away, we kind of have a really interesting slice of the Sanders family's life that, that doesn't exactly connect with ours. It kind of puts us in a different, in a different world. And that's what's, what I like about this stuff. So of course, we also found some bottles. Not a lot, surprisingly. But um, some medicinal bottles uh, on the left there is a, is a Dr. Kennedy's medical discovery. Uh, you know, this was one of the cure-alls that was marketed basically from the late 1840s all the way to, I think, right around World War II. It was made in Binghamton, New York, funny enough, where I did my, my graduate work. Uh, I did not know <laughs> until I did some research on this. And then on the right-hand side, you know, it, it's a wine or liquor bottle, a little bit more refined, so, you know, possibly... Um, you know, a brandy or, or some, you know, more, more expensive alcohol. But very few of these. But we also found a beer bottle, a nearly, a, a, in fact, a complete beer bottle. Um, when we removed it from the soil, the, the pressure, soil pressure had uh, broken it, but held all the pieces in place. And what was really interesting, more so than the bottle itself, was what we found on the inside. So, so that gunk is actually the residue of whatever beer was in there. Um, when it was thrown out, it still had some, some material in it, some liquid, and you know, it just kind of gunked up with soil. Um, the exciting thing is there's enough there that we were able to work with, we're working with some colleagues at UW-Whitewater who work in chemistry and biology, and they have started to analyze the residue, and they've confirmed it is definitely beer, and they're working on basically matching through chemical means the, the types of hops, the kinds of grains, and they're going to regrow the yeast that was used to ferment the beer. So I, I kid you not, we're at some point, we're hoping within a year, we're going to be able to essentially reconstruct the recipe for Sanders Blacksmith's beer, <laughs> and, and we're, going to, we're going to try to brew it. We're going to try to rebrew it. Um, Whitewater has, has, is blessed with a, a brew pub, so we have, who, that's run by a historian. So, so this is one of those stay tuned things. We're, we're going to try to put it together. You know, we, we, if, if it all goes well, if it doesn't taste awful, you know, we might try to do it as a fundraiser of some sort. So we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk more about that. But so that's one of the kind of exciting little fun things that, that we're able to do with this. Um, you know, it, how much it tells us about the Sanders, mm, I don't know, but maybe it tells us more about us really, with how excited we are about this, but we'll see. Um, one of the things we did, though, was did a quick census of brewers uh, that were operating in the area in the late 1860s. Um, what's interesting is uh, quite a few, and of course, you have to think about that period uh, with the level of refrigeration technology and transportation, it's very likely that uh, that bottle, unmarked though it is, was whatever it had in it was made somewhere right around here. And we see Rippon, you know, has two lager beer breweries operating at that time. Fond du Lac has two, even, even Wapun has one. And then, not surprisingly, Oshkosh is already kind of a brewing monster. Uh, and, you know, I think it's reasonable to say, you know, there may have been smaller breweries operating that, that just didn't make the city directories in that time. But very likely somewhere on this list is, you know, the, the company that was responsible for, for putting whatever it was that was in that beer bottle. So, you know, we may never be able to say for certain, but, but we, you know, just given the time at which this beer was produced, we can say with high confidence it came from around here. So this is going to be a local brew. So we're pretty excited about that. Okay, so this is where I have to talk about blacksmith stuff. Um, are there any blacksmiths here tonight? Any folks who dabble? Okay, good. So I can... I can make it up. Um, I am learning a lot about blacksmithing right now, uh, and I'll, I'll explain how I'm doing that. But, but this is basically where it all started, slag, right? And this is a, a, a textbook byproduct of metalworking processes. The, the great part is, even though it is rather ugly, uh, there are a whole lot of really interesting things we can learn about the, what Sanders was actually doing in his shop. Um, we can determine the temperatures, types of fuel, whether he was using charcoal or uh, coal of various types to heat his forge, um, what the, the nature of the hearth that he was using in his forge. So all that's kind of really funny technical information. The useful part about it is, and what may be surprising to everybody is, blacksmithing, because it remained essentially a practical trade, a practical art, it was entirely taught by word of mouth, by apprenticeship, by you know, learning by doing. So as a result, even into the early 20th century, there were essentially no 
no textbooks on you know, how you become a blacksmith in 1870. There were no, let alone guides to how you would run a blacksmith shop in that period. So, so while we know a lot about the, the basic premises of how you would work metal, there's a whole lot that we can learn about the actual day-to-day -day operations. You know, say even if we had a textbook, right, there's always that gap between what the textbook says and what you actually do, you know, when somebody brings you a, a broken plow and you need to fix it. So that's kind of one of the things that we're going to try to learn a lot more about. Um, and one of the things that we're getting a good sense of from what is essentially Sanders' scrap heap is the kinds of work that he was doing for the community. And of course, a lot of it was repairing agricultural implements. Um, up top there, that's, that big chunk there is a, what's called a coulter. It's, it's a piece of a, a moldboard plow. Um, really common that these would break. They're the thing that sort of makes the initial cut into the soil before the moldboard picks up the soil and rolls it over. So they would break all the time. Um, then, and that sort of partially triangular thing there, that's a blade from a sickle that probably broke and had to be replaced. And of course, Sanders is doing all this work and he's collecting the broken pieces and he's throwing them on his scrap pile because metal is expensive, metal, metal is, is valuable and he never knows when he's gonna be able to use it again. So that's essentially what we have to thank for all this sort of ugly but really interesting stuff. Uh, here's a lot of the hand objects we found. We don't know if these were objects that Sanders made himself or that someone, a customer brought into him and said, hey, could you make one of these because it's broken? But they give you a sense of the, the kind of nature of the, the range of the work that he was being asked to do. Um, some more stuff, um, that, that pointy thing in the middle there, it's probably one of the most recognizable things. That's a pintle, it's a, it's a hinge essentially for a large door on a rough building. So the pointy end would be driven into the door frame, the little thumb bit would stick up and you'd hang your door from two of those and it would swing. So those were, and that was a really common thing for rural blacksmiths to do because of course they were providing uh, building materials and tools for all the other trades, you know, in the area. And, oop, and I hit something else here. Can you go away? There we go. And then this guy here, this is again one of the more interesting things. Apparently didn't quite make it, but you can already see that this is a knife blank. This would have evolved into a blade, of course on the left to the thicker end, and then the tang where a handle, probably wooden handle or bone handle would have been attached on the right hand side. You know, so, and this is probably made from steel, whereas a lot of this other stuff is wrought iron. Very, steel was extremely hard to get, of course. So a lot of times they would salvage, say an old, uh, a file, you know, a working file that they would use to shape. Uh, once it could no longer be sharpened, it was no longer useful, that material became really good for making things that had to keep you know, edges on them. So this was probably a piece of a file or some other similar tool that was repurposed into a knife blank, but never got finished. Oop, oop, let's go back, I keep hitting that pad. There we go. And then of course he was also doing a lot of repairs to wagons. And this is an interesting transition for blacksmiths. Is a lot of, this is a, a bearing from a wagon wheel. Uh, these are cast iron, and this would have been very difficult for a rural blacksmith to work, uh, essentially impossible to repair. Um, so what he had to do was get a prefabricated uh, object, repair, replacement part, and his customers would come in with a broken wheel, a broken bearing, and he would drive out the old bearing, pop in the new one, and they'd be good to go. But this is an interesting transition because here we see the beginning of a trend, right? The blacksmith used to be the guy you went to if you needed something made and he would make it from scratch just for you. But now as technology is becoming much more complex, they aren't, blacksmiths aren't able to necessarily produce from raw materials the things that people need, so they're having to buy prefabricated stuff, and that's changing the, changing the practice in important ways. So we see a little bit of that. And here on the other hand, here are some uh, sort of vehicle-related objects that he's making by hand, or that someone else made by hand and had to be replaced because they had broken and Sanders did that work. So these are parts of uh, wagons. This is probably a, a kingpin plate or a, or a fifth wheel plate. And then uh, part of a, uh, it's the piece that attaches uh, to a buggy and essentially holds the, the rails that the horses are, are harnessed to on a light, a light vehicle. So, and then tools, I'm gonna move through this kind of quickly. That thing on the right there used to look like those things on the left there. It's called a brace drill. Probably one of the tools in Sanders' shop must have gotten broken and couldn't be salvaged. Um, and of course we're finding other tools as well. And the other thing we're finding is a lot of little bits of scrap that Sanders is recycling. He's 
saving and then making use of again. And the thing that gives this away is what's called a, a hardy cut mark. And what I'm talking about here are these really distinctive angular jagged cuts in the metal. That, that, that thing up there in the upper left corner is actually a piece of a horseshoe that he's cut up to use for other things. And if you see in this schematic of, a, of an anvil here, you see the, there's a thing pointing to a little square hole. It's called the hardy hole. And the, the purpose of that was you could attach, you could just drop various additional tools into the hardy hole. And one of the co most common one was a little wedge. And if you wanted to cut metal, you heat it up, the metal you wanted to cut, place it over top of the, the hardy wedge, and just drive your hammer onto it, onto that hot metal, and work it down over the, over the wedge, creating this real distinctive triangular uh, jagged cut. So this was a coarse way of cutting. This was just sort of a, a beginning part of the process. But it, you know, immediately, again, it sort of takes us right inside Sanders' shop, and we sort of start to understand you know, how he's working metal in a way that we wouldn't be able to access any other way. Now, these are the guys I have to thank for explaining all this to me, because I am learning about blacksmithing. But Paul Hammond and Daryl Reindeller themselves both work at the Historical Society's uh, two living history museums that have working blacksmith shops. Uh, Paul works over at um, the Wade House, and Daryl works down at Old World Wisconsin. And we had them come to our lab over the winter, take a look at all this stuff, and really explain it to us. You know, show us the tool marks and explain to us the processes. And they basically, they were invaluable. So you know, I want to give them a little shout out, uh, because we couldn't, we couldn't have gotten anything near what we got out of that material. To us, it looks just like a bunch of rusty metal. But to them, to practiced, you know, knowledgeable, practicing blacksmiths, it speaks volumes. So that was really helpful. So, so now I want to run real quick through the last part of our, our presentation here. This is, this is where we had gotten to the point where we knew a lot about Sanders, and we had some really fundamental research questions that we could take to the archives and try to answer. So those are essentially, first, what brought him to Rosendale Township in the first place? And then, you know, can we really prove any of these claims that he attended the Little White Schoolhouse meetings or that he was responsible for naming the Republican Party? Um, and is there any evidence to support the claim that he was active in the Underground Railroad? Because again, that's a really historically significant but difficult to prove claim. And then finally, you know, why did they sell their farm in 1883? Why did they leave and where did they go? So, so we started to do some digging. Um, we still don't know exactly what brought James to Rosendale, but this is one of these, this is why I find him so interesting. As we go through this, you will see that somehow or other, he manages to be entwined with a lot of the major events that have kind of shaped the local history around the Ripon and sort of Western Fond du Lac County area. And that's what I find fascinating about him. So here he is, uh, you know, an obituary from Kansas, which is, of course, where he ended up, um, about how he moved to Southport, Wisconsin in 1845. Now, so Southport, I'll give you a hint, Southport is Kenosha. Right? That's the, the old name for Kenosha. Anybody, any local historians know of some other major movement that affected this area started in Kenosha in 1844, 1845? Suresco. Suresco, exactly. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, um, the, uh, uh, what I want to say, um, Warren Chase and the 19 other men who founded the Suresco settlement in 1844, 45, uh, started in Southport in Kenosha, uh, established the Wisconsin Phalanx, moved up, you know, bought the land up here, and then just a year later, coincidentally or not, James Sanders comes to Southport and then buys, or actually squats on, you know, 100 acres here just six miles from, from the Soresco settlement. So we don't know for sure. Um, we don't know if we have, there's no records of any formal relationship between Sanders and the, the Soresco community. They had a blacksmith, uh, you know, who was a member of the community. Um, so, and it wasn't Sanders, but, but, you know, puzzling. It's a curious coincidence, maybe more than a coincidence. Um, then this whole issue of this, the Little White Schoolhouse. Can we prove he was there? And of course, the short answer is most of you who've maybe looked into this is no, because the records were terrible. You know, they, they didn't keep minutes, they didn't really take attendance, and very little uh, detail information was ever uh, published publicly on the, the events. But, once again, there's an interesting breadcrumb trail. And it started with this. Um, a history grad student at UW uh, published, or put together a master's thesis on the Republican Party in Wisconsin back in the 1970s. And he stumbled on this. This is so great. So 
I want, to look, want you to look at the date. So this is a meeting that was held in Rosendale, the village of Rosendale, uh, to uh, organize against the, right, um, what they call the Nebraska swindle. This was basically the, the proposed federal legislation that would potentially allow slavery to expand into the new western states. And it outraged a lot of abolitionists and others. Uh, but here, you see, look at the date. 22nd of April. A meeting is held in Rosendale. All that we know is that former uh, Senator Pinckney was presiding. We don't know who was there, but, but there it was in Rosendale. This is basically the fourth public meeting that was held on this issue in Wisconsin. There was, of course, the one in Milwaukee, one in, I think, Janesville, one in Beloit, and then one in Rosendale. And then just a week later, right, we start to have, this is a terrible photocopy, but this is the announcement for the, the first meeting at the Congregational Church to oppose the Nebraska bill. And then, of course, that leads on to the announcement for the schoolhouse meeting. And you see, the, this, is, this is more or less all we have. These four names, Bowers, Loper, Bovey, and Reynolds, and 50 others who were, were sponsoring this meeting to, to organize against the Nebraska swindle. Um, and that's all we know. Uh, others have tried to uh, recoup from family memories who was there, but, but that you know, becomes more difficult to prove. So then, of course, there's the big meeting and you know, what's typically hailed as the, the moment where uh, what makes Ripon the titular birth, birthplace of the Republican Party, where for the first time one of these public meetings calls out for, uh, essentially, right, they say, um, if the bill were to pass, it would be the call to arms of a great northern party, such a, such a one as the country has never seen before. You know, so this is the first time that a group of people gather and say, you know, the, the solution to this problem is a new party. And that's, of course, what kicks off the story that we all know already. Was, was Sanders there? We don't know. We, it's, we can't tell. But, you know, just a year later, the Republican Party, now fully named and organized, is holding a mass meeting in Ripon in October, actually or beginning of November, and sure enough, there's our guy representing Rosendale at the, at the mass meeting. And then as a result of this meeting, Sanders is selected as one of the district committee, uh, to serve on the district committee for the new Republican Party in Western Fond du Lac County. So this is, you know, this is just a year and some later than the initial meetings. And so I think what's interesting is, I don't, don't want to, Right here? Oh yeah, right, here he's serving again at a, a meeting just in a week later on the Committee on Resolutions. So, so our guy is a bit of an operative already, just a year later. And to me, that says, we can't really prove he was there, but, but the fact that he rises so quickly to become a pretty high-ranking member of the local Republican Party structure really suggests that he was there from the beginning. So we can't prove it, but good chance he was there, and that he essentially continued to ride that you know, as a committed member of the, of the emerging party. So it does leave this other question kind of hanging. Did he, did he name the Republican Party? We, uh, this is one of those we're never just gonna, we're not gonna be able to answer, ever. Um, the records are just don't exist. And what's interesting is, of course, it, if we were to entertain it as a plausible, uh, what do I wanna say? Uh, yeah, a sort of, uh, Exciting possibility. It doesn't actually contradict the sort of reigning story of how the Republican Party got its name. You know, more or less, I'm not an expert in this, but all I've been able to see is that Alvin Bove eventually claims that he pitched the name to uh, Horace Greeley, the, the big advocate and the New York Times Tribune publisher, and, and then it became adopted at the next big meeting in Michigan. But where did Alvin Bove get the idea? We don't, I don't know, does he, does he say? I don't know. But so anyway, it, it's, 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 it's kind of an exciting possibility, but we'll never know. Oh, wait, so. La, 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 la. Now, this is the other, the last issue I want to really talk about. This is the Underground Railroad. Sorry to keep you all waiting. But this is one of those really hard ones because as a secretive activity that was essentially illegal after 1850, a federal crime uh, after 1850, people kept it secret. Uh, you know, the, Basically, all we have are a few first-person first accounts uh, of escaping slaves' experiences moving through Wisconsin, two that are well-documented, and then a few family stories. So um, on the plus side, we do have 
absolute evidence that Sanders was involved in the 1860 Booth Affair, uh, also known as the Ripon Booth War. Um, I'll give you, uh, again, I'm not an expert in this, and probably many of you know much more about this than I do, but I'll give you the short nutshell version. Um, 1850, right, fugitive slave law is passed. Um, Wisconsin is a free state. Uh, that arguably violates the Wisconsin Constitution, but it stands. 1854, in the midst of all this, this brouhaha that's leading up to the formation of the Republican Party, uh, an escaped slave named Joshua Glover, who's living in Milwaukee, has been living in Milwaukee for years, uh, is suddenly, uh, oh, I should say too, uh, 1850 Fugitive Slave Law actually also essentially permits slave catchers, bounty hunters, to come up from southern states, enter, cross borders into free states, and take escaped slaves back into, you know, nominally escaped slaves back into custody and take them back to the south. Um, so a lot of people don't like this. They see it as a violation of states' rights. Um, that should be <laughs> a, familiar, <laughs> a familiar phrase. Um, Joshua Glover is caught by two slave catchers in Milwaukee, and they throw him in county jail overnight before they transport him back to the South. Sherman Booth is a radical abolitionist, a newspaper publisher in Milwaukee. He finds out what happened. He starts spreading the word and essentially raises a, a vigilante mob of like-minded men. They go to the jail, break Joshua Glover out, escort him through Wisconsin and out to, uh, to Canada to free soil. Uh, this is, of course, a violation of federal law. Uh, so there's a, a bunch of legal wrangling. The law comes down hardest on Sherman Booth as the sort of instigator of the mob. Right? He fights it for years and years, takes it to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. But eventually, federal law trumps, and he goes to jail. So a few years later, in 1860, uh, some, again, like-minded individuals decide that it's, it's not morally justifiable that Mr. Booth should sit in prison for doing what he did. So they decide to break him out of the Milwaukee jail. And uh, this, I, this is a, just an amazing story. Um, it makes me laugh every time. So, so they uh, form a militia and essentially escort him up to Waupon. He's held there for, held in, under protection there for a few days, basically under the auspices of the, the warden of the Waupon jail, uh, who has also formed a bit of a militia, because their presumption is that federal marshals are going to come to pursue Booth and try to take him back into custody. Uh, after a few days in Waupon, he moves up to Ripon. He's brought here because it's understood that this is a you know, pretty friendly territory. Um, and it's, it's not like he's hiding. He comes here and he gives a public speech. Um, everybody knows he's in town. They publish you know, in the newspaper, Sherman Booth is coming to town. Um, so the federal marshals show up the night of uh, Booth's appearance. And basically, as soon as he starts his, his speech, one of the marshals stands up and says, you know, I have a federal warrant for your arrest and tries to grab him. And remarkably, you know, essentially the rest of the people in the hall stand up, take the marshals bodily and throw them out of the hall. And, you know, so think about what this and what the thinking, you know, of this entails. Um, they, they chase them back to the Mapes Hotel, the Mapes house where the marshals are staying. They send Booth out again uh, into hiding and then they begin to organize to negotiate with the marshals. Uh, but basically, they pass, they pass a resolution that Sherman Booth will not be taken back into custody while he remains in Ripon, um, which is a pretty, it's a pretty bold statement. Uh, so there's a, a great little you know, explanation after the day after Sherman Booth, the, the first attempt of the marshals to rearrest Booth. There's a big gathering somewhere in a grove, and they talk about who's there and what happens. Oh, sorry, I missed my cue again. And there's our guy, J.W. Sanders. He's serving on a committee to uh, put together, basically, to put together the negotiation papers that are going to be given to the marshals. Um, and he's serving with, uh, if you see, look, two over, uh, with uh, uh, Pickett, right? Ooh, what am I thinking? Armin, Armin Pickett, uh, an eponymous just up the road on Highway 44 in Winnebago County. Um, so, so this is, a, you know, a, a large group of citizens here. They call, them, uh, they call themselves the Vigilance Committee. Uh, to protect Booth. So anyway, so, this, so here we are, I have Sanders protecting this radical abolitionist who's uh, been broken out of jail. And, uh, and not just him, but a large number of the community. Now, now Booth is moved to Armin Pickett's house in Pickett Station. And eventually the federal marshals find out where he's hiding. They come to Pickett's home early in the morning. And um, there's, there's a bit of a standoff. Uh, they're trying not to create, the marshals are trying not to create a violent situation. So while Armin kind of distracts them by arguing, you know, his, his property rights with them, 
uh, one of the picket sons runs out the back, charges around the neighborhood, warns all the neighbors of what's happening, and eventually gets to the village of Pickett, or sorry, village of Rosendale, and warns people there. So again, another sort of spontaneous vigilante mob descends on Armin Pickett's house, and they once again take the marshals by the arms, hold them for a period of time, and then basically kick them down the road and say, no, you're not taking them custody. Um, so, you know, again, kind of remarkable how far these people are willing to go for this, this you know, moral, morally held position. And what happens, it, eventually, the marshals decide they are not going to be able to take him into custody while he's anywhere in this part of Wisconsin. And they have to wait until he's brought down to uh, Berlin, I think, to give a speech later in the year where they finally, the marshals organize this big, uh, they literally bring in a, a, a small army by train and surprise Booth and take him back into custody. But anyway, and, and then Booth is eventually pardoned when it all falls out after the Civil War, right? I mean, the Civil War sort of decides things, right? But, um, but a remarkable story. And I, I think it speaks a lot about, you know, where, where the political climate was here, you know, in that time. And what's interesting is, while we, again, can't put James there by name, we know he's involved with the, the committee to protect Booth, and he's only two and a half miles from the, the picket house. So what are the odds that he wasn't one of those houses that the, the picket son came to, to say, hey, you know, the marshals are here for Sherman, you've got to come. Um, so was, I think there's a good argument to be made that very likely. The other thing that plugs in really nicely is uh, in the obituary, in Sanders' obituary from 1904, his brother claims that he had two confrontations with federal marshals. And of course, during the Booth affair, there were two confrontations with federal marshals. So very likely, he's referring specifically, not, not specifically to Underground Railroad activity, but to this, this Booth war. And so where does that leave us as far as real Underground Railroad events? We don't know. All that we can say is he was clearly a, a passionate, committed abolitionist. Um, and, but what we're doing is we're doing some ongoing research, and this is kind of one of those other stay tuned things. We're trying to locate uh, any reported or documented sites related to the Underground, underground Railroad in uh, the Waupon area, Western Fond du Lac County, into Brown County, Winnebago and Brown. Uh, we're pondering the idea that there may have been a corridor here that allowed people to move overland across Wisconsin, maybe coming out of Missouri through Wisconsin and then up to Green Bay, to the port at Green Bay, because there are really good documented uh, episodes or events where escaped slaves were uh, held or protected by families in Green Bay who had connections to ship's captains who were also sympathetic. And the families would arrange for these captains as they came into port to take on these escaping slaves. And then, you know, the ship would just happen to dock in a Canadian port at some point and, you know, and they were free. So, so that would be a neat connection to make if we can. Uh, but like I said, stay tuned for that. So finally, just to wrap things up, you know, where did the family go? We know that the sons had left Rosendale by 18, the 1870s. They had, one had moved out to Kansas and the other to Oshkosh. And their other adult son had tuberculosis by 1880. And he may have left very soon after as well to move to Kansas. But so we know that the household labor force was kind of, was greatly reduced by 1880. And one of the things we looked at to try to understand this was the US Census of Agriculture. And what it shows is that the Sanders farm was still productive, but, but not the way it had been in 1860 or 70. Um, I just love to show this for anyone who's doing genealogical research. If you haven't had the opportunity to look at the agricultural census, this is one of the things you have to go you know, down to Madison to look at the, the original or microfilm manuscripts. They aren't really available in uh, digital form from Ancestry. But basically what a census taker went farm to farm, every farm in the entire US of, of any reasonable size, and they inventoried you know, how much acreage do you have, how much of that's improved, how many cows did you have, how much hay did you grow last year, um, how many chickens did you have, you know, did you have, any, did you have a, an orchard? Um, the details are amazing. And for, you know, for folks who have farming descend, uh, ancestors, and of course, that's pretty much all of us, um, you know, this really gives you a really interesting picture of what you know, those, your ancestors might have been doing. Uh, as farmers in these, these early eras. So it's really neat. But for us, and this is kind of one of those things I wanted to show you, what it shows is while the Sanders kind of continued to produce more and more wheat each year, they were doing so in a period where wheat prices were falling and soil exhaustion was starting to set in and really reduce yields. 
And all of their neighbors were switching to grow corn in this, this era, right around the 1870s, 80s, but not the Sanders. And this is kind of what it looked like here. Uh, you see Sanders family's corn production is in the, the green bars. And you see in 1860, they're basically at the bottom of the, the, the group here. It, no, I don't want to do that. How do I say? No, oh, good. So, you know, this black bar represents a rough uh, range of what their neighbors were producing. Purple is the mean, the average. And you see Sanders is down here at the bottom. He's not really grown a lot of wheat. 1870 comes along. Suddenly he's kind of up right around, right around the average, right around the mean. But all his neighbors are producing less. And then by 1880, his neighbors are producing a lot less. The average is here, but Sanders is suddenly almost producing more wheat than corn or barley or you know, any of the other major crops. And, and that was just not a good time to be doing that. So we, we hypothesize that between the loss of his sons and the, the labor that they represented and this decision, clearly he was a, a competent, capable farmer, but he may just have not seen the writing on the wall that a lot of his neighbors saw. And at some point, the farm may have become less financially stable, and they decided to sell. They got 5,600 bucks for it in 1883. And what we know is they moved somewhere in the vicinity of Milwaukee, uh, where they stayed for about another 10 years. But we can't find a trace of them until 1895, when they turn up living with their eldest son's family in Kansas. Both the son and um, James were still working as liverymen, you know, working in the horse business. Uh, and the barn business. And then by, by five years later, they had moved to uh, Marquette City, Kansas, and James was farming again, the son, but James W. was still working as the proprietor of the Eagle Livery. And there's a, there's a great ad that shows up. Um, James Sanders, proprietor, we are still at our post. And you know, he's, he's in his mid to late 70s at this point. Um, and, but just a few years later, or a few months later, actually, uh, his wife Nancy passes away. Uh, in Kansas. She was a Seventh-day Adventist for her, most of her adult life. Um, but James continued to run the livery for uh, just a few more months uh, and then later moved to Kansas City to live with his younger son where, you know, just a few years later, you know, he only survived his wife by, by four years almost exactly. Um, he passed away at his son's house at 79 years of age. And so I just want to, I want to kind of share this with you to close with. This is what the, the obituary editor for the Marquette Tribune was kind of moved to observe about Sanders in passing. So being a man of large sympathy, he was always found fighting on the side of the common people. And I think that's kind of beautiful. You know, that, that, that captures the, the kind of the personhood of this, this really remarkably civically engaged individual who was willing to go to like great lengths for, for what he felt was, was morally correct. Um, so I think that's great. So that, like I said, that kind of brings us back to the man. Um, so just to wrap up real quick, you know, really a man in the middle of things, you know, in the, 18, in the latter half of the 19th century here in, in Rosendale and Ripon, and a man of strong convictions. He got caught up in all of these fabulous events that really defined Ripon's early history. And while he wasn't really one of the necessarily celebrated leaders, he was always one of those 50 others, right, who was always there to, to kind of provide the energy and the conviction that drove a lot of these things forward um, and really allowed them to take root within the community. Um, so I think that what makes him a really valuable figure to, to, to remember, you know, and to, to, not, to not go un, unmentioned in Ripon history. Uh, so that's what, what I'm really happy about this project. And of course, as I said, we are still doing more archaeological research on this, uh, on the material from the site, and we're hoping we'll have some, some more news about, you know, what it was like to be a rural blacksmith uh, in, in Rip, uh, Rosendale Township in the mid-19th century. And that's where we'd like to go with things. So I'm going to leave it there. Just a few people, to, many people to thank, honestly. But thank you so much for, for giving me the time. And, you know, like I said, I, as we were talking earlier, I am, I am by no means an expert in the local history. Uh, because we do tend to jump from project to project, uh, I know a lot about this and not a lot about anything else. Uh, but I would be happy to try to answer any questions you have. Mm, yes. Well, Jacob Woodruff was the blacksmith of the Soresco. Of Soresco, yes. And he was an ardent abolitionist. Right, he was right. One of the signatories on the beginnings of the Republican Party as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think that's probably not a coincidence, right? That, okay. yeah. The Fresco Phalanx was a very closed community. Mm -hmm. In fact, you had to apply to get in it, and then you went on to some yes. kind of probation. Okay. Yeah. And I think the reason for that is that they wanted to find out if you were a blabbermouth or not. <laughs> Phalanx itself functioned as a station on the Underground Railroad. Right, right. I think that that I would. I was going to say. So I I left some cards on the table here, and if if y'all have stories about Underground Railroad activity around the area, I would love for you to get in touch with me. Um, we probably won't have time to share them all tonight, but that's one of these things we're kind of building as a database and a map that kind of plots out where these locations might have been. Uh, again, to sort of see if we see a pattern, see a corridor that looks like it might have been really viable. So that I am not surprised about at all. I think there's a, there's a really interesting, some of you may already be aware of this, but there's a really interesting connection between Soresco and the formation of the Republican Party that I think has yet to really be um, uh, explored you know, and published fully that I'd love to get into at some point, but maybe after we're done. <laughs> yes? In naming the Republican Party, doesn't the GOP part of it too? Grand old party, GOP? I, you know, I, I don't know the history. I think, I think that may have sort of aver, emerged later. Um, and the trick with the notion that the Republican Party, the, the word Republican was sort of a new thing, is one of the hard parts of, of really giving any one individual credit for, for choosing that name. Because, of course, you know, the term Republican was out there in the public sphere applied to all kinds of things. So the, the idea that it was um, appropriate to grab for a, a, the name of a new political party you know, may not have been super novel, but somebody did make that decision at some point. And that's, you know, so that's why it kind of remains a, an issue. Of, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic. Right, right, it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, you know, it was, a, it was a concept that was in the air, and, but someone said, you know, well, this is this captures what we're about. You know, as a party, this is the name that that's right for us. So, you know, that that may be something we never know for sure. But but it is kind of it's interesting to speculate based on what little evidence we have, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carol. Um, Bobby, um, what would you consider? Are you for stories of, of reports of underground railroads? We get activity. We get um, get that every so often. Right. Right. Um, are you looking I'd, for just stories from relatives, you know, in the area, ancestors in the area? Yeah. Some people yeah. Will call up. It's like, oh, we got a, <coughs> you know, we got a room in our basement. It's like, well, they probably proved something. <laughs> right. Well, that's so. so right. Uh, right. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, because it's so hard to to prove anything. Um, I, I'm kind of open. I would love to hear anything. Um, and the way we're kind of organizing this database is, is on sort of a tiered. Uh, basis related to the, what do I want to say, how firm, how, how well we can support the claim. Um, and so, so we're, we're kind of, we have reported sites and then we have confirmed sites and we have, you know, sites we're really not sure of, but, but maybe. So we're kind of, we're kind of looking at, at all, all ranges of, of stuff, but I'd love to hear anything. You know, I mean, you know, if, if you, if someone's got a family member who says, I remember, you know, my great grandmother, 1850, said, and there is a story like that from Ripon, of a, of a girl who remembers uh, a, a man being hidden up in their the eaves of their house, uh, in her room, inkwell. one night. Yes, is the Inkwell House. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps someone in the audience can give credit to or contradict. I heard a rumor back in the middle 60s that there was a bakery shop on uh, downtown Ripon that did have a cave underneath it. Right. That was part I, of the, that was the 70s, because we came, it was after. Yeah, yeah, and someone, like the, the city opened up the street for some utility work, so they looked into the vault. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it was actually made into a big drama that they right. could open it and find all this, and there was nothing. Yeah, it was a little bit of a sort of, um, there is a, you know, Al Capone's vault kind of there situation. There is a house in Fond du Lac on Main Street that mm -hmm. they knew of was part of the Underground Railroad that had a secret room in it. Yep. Yep. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a general sense that uh, octagon houses in general were, were very likely uh, recognized as, as potentially friendly stops for, for people who were fleeing through the countryside. But, but yeah, again, very hard to, hard to document, hard to prove. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a little girl, uh, they, there used to be a store in Pickett, 
all the pickets, they served ice cream cones, real big ice cream cones. Mm -hmm. An old fountain, yeah. We are always told that that was a stop off for Steve. slaves. Yes. It wasn't, it was kind of quiet, but the rumor was that that was a place where the picket co op is now. Mm -hmm. They had still a building there. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah the, the, picket, the picket family uh, has, a, has a pretty strong oral tradition. Uh, Sort to, in the same vein as, as Sanders, that, that they harbored a number of escaped slaves coming through there. And that very store yeah. apparently was a hush-hush, but something was going on right in the store. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, that start, what I'm finding interesting is that starts to draw a nice line between some reports we have from, uh, oh, I'm not going to be able to remember the township, but, but essentially the Wapan area mm -hmm. to Ripon to you know, through Sanders' property to Pickett, you know, that, that starts to, you know, make sense as a corridor that people might have made use of. So that, that's kind of, that's exactly the sort of thing we're looking for. Yeah, anything else? What's going to happen with the Highway 44 project? Well, so I don't, I, thankfully I am not an engineer. I mean, no, no offense to engineers, but, um, but I, I just hear that they're moving ahead with it. Um, what, did, what, did they, what did they tell you, April? Last time? Next year. Next year. Next year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we might it's, see something, you, you know. Something they could stop it, though, if you find something significant. Well, yes and no. I mean, I mean typically what we do here, you know, it, the notion is, well, you know, the road must go through, right? So, so our work is to recover any meaningful data before before it gets lost. So there, there are very few, as, as you probably all know, you know, there's very few things that stop the road. Um, you know, even bodies, even human remains, don't necessarily make the road go the other way. Um, so, so you'll probably see it coming next where, year. Where exactly yeah. is this that we can? Where exactly is this? The the site location. Um, well, like I said, it's it's about uh, six miles northeast out of town on 44. Um, you see a lovely Victorian farmhouse. What what's your address, April? <laughs> <laughs> you want, but but it is private land. I, I'll, I'll say you know it, it is literally just a cornfield. Uh, you know there's there's nothing left standing. Um, you but didn't yeah. Recognize it from the highway. No, no. I mean there there is you know. The house you would see from the highway on the right hand side of the road is the house. The right, car. right. Yeah. You know is it? It's yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's keeping in mind that it is private property, and you know we don't don't want to. Uh, impact those those owners you know private life um, but um, but you know if you watch your mileage gauge as you're driving out of town you'll 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 see the field it's there's a slight bend in 44 that's part of the issue that the highway engineers want to straighten that bend a bit uh, so if you find yourself about six miles out of town and you're bending a bit to the north then you're right there you're you're at the Sanders farm mm -hmm. um, when we moved to Ripon uh, we were able to hold on to our original abstract that went from basically the United States government all the way through. Right, right. And it went to a Michael, someone to the Wisconsin Phalanx, to Warren uh, Chase. Mm -hmm. I've got that all laminated. Oh, nice, was, interesting. Yeah, yeah. But on the next block, two houses down, where the, where the, Dav well, the Davises lived there. But in the middle house, there was a carver, a duck carver. Uh -huh. had a shop out by alibis. But anyway, when we went into that house, it hadn't had anything done since the 1850s. It had the original mustard covered uh, cards. Yeah. And at the time, when the city we modeled the bathroom down into there, and they found a, it wasn't hooked up to the city water. I don't know how long <laughs> they right. couldn't find where right. this was going. Yep. And we eventually, when we tore the chimney out, filled the whole up. And I don't know what that ever went to. Yeah, yeah. But it very well could have been to something. Yeah, you never know. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. I, I just did want to be remiss as a historical society. Um, here at the Ripon Historical Society, our mission is to help inform the public of what those are. A lot of people, when I moved here to Ripon, did not know what Soresco or the Phalanx were, was. So if anybody, if you've heard that term tonight, there were two different cities here at one time. There was Soresco and Ripon. Those are combined into one city. But Jack, who lives in Soresco, still says he's from Soresco. <laughs> <laughs>
right back. <laughs> it had its own school, it, it had everything. So there were two different cities at one time and we're one now. Um, so if, if you're confused about Sorusco and where Sorusco is, uh, it, it's really just ripping. But it would be that whole area down where Pizza Hut was uh, going south down South Union Street in that area. Uh, mm. And Soresco Square is Ceresco still there, Square. right? There's a park there, Soresco Park. Uh, so that was a separate city at one time that was started as like a utopian type community. Mm. Mm. Right. So if anybody, mm -hmm. if those two terms yeah. were thrown around tonight, we don't want to confuse anybody because it is all one city now. But Jack will say it's not. So. <laughs> <laughs> well. On that, on that note, if anybody uh, is interested in joining the Historical Society, there's membership forms on the front table, too, if you want to join in on the fun and learn. Yes, yes, I wanted, to, I wanted to say two two things. So one thing, May is officially Wisconsin's Historic Preservation and Archaeology Month. So that's one of the other kind of great things about, about being here tonight. Um, there, there is a calendar. If you Google uh, Wisconsin Historic Preservation Archaeology Month calendar, um, you'll It'll save you the time of trying to work through the Historic Society's website because it's awful. Um, but, but it'll get you to a calendar that will uh, provide a, a listing of all kinds of similar types of events that are going on all over the state all month long. Um, and you know, so I encourage you to look into that. Uh, there are a lot of great programs and there's, there's just a remarkable amount of work that's going on all across the state that, that I, you know, even I don't know about until I see ads for these things. Um, so I encourage you to take advantage of that. And as, as Pat was saying, um, you know, just as a, as a as a little bit of a push, you know, we, you know, we live in an era of kind of shrinking government support for, you know, these kinds of institutions. So, you know, so if you appreciate having access to these kinds of programs, um, you know, it really does kind of fall to us to, to support, you know, these organizations that make these things possible, you know, like your local historical society. And, you know, I brought some, some stuff from the state historical society as well and membership forms there. Uh, the, the posters, the bookmarks, they're all free. They're all, uh, part of you know, the promotional stuff for Historic Preservation Month. So help yourself. And, and I also left cards on the, on the table there uh, if you want to get in touch with me. Uh, but, uh, but otherwise, I'd say um, you know, I'll, be, I'll be around for, for a bit yet if, if any of you have things you'd like to talk about. But, but um, otherwise, you know, thanks so much for, for coming and listening and, and sharing your stories with me, too. Thank you. <laughs>